Awesome. Thank you. I am unmuting myself and moving the doc around. So, hey, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Everett Pompey. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining me for Run Fast, Catch Performance Gressions in eBPF with Rust. This is uh, going to be a little bit more of an extended session from my uh, LinuxCon talk that uh, I gave back uh, at the Linux conference. So, all righty. Uh, as I said, I am Ever Pompey, and uh, that's my email. If uh, you guys have any questions or anything after the talk, and uh, that is the repository for uh, Venture, which is a tool we'll be talking about here in a bit. All righty. So what is eBPF? Kind of to start off with uh, all the buzzwords in the title there. Uh, eBPF, if you kind of think about it conceptually, you have user space and kernel space. And uh, eBPF, you take your source code and um, and then you compile it down to eBPF bytecode. That then gets handed over to the kernel side and put into the eBPF verifier, which basically makes sure that uh, it can kind of solve the halting problem essentially on it. And then as long as that checks and uh, it does that, then it's good to go. And then it moves it over to the eBPF VM again inside the kernel and it gets run. And so there's a lot of restrictions on that VM and things like that and how that verifier works. And we'll talk about that a bit more as we go through. All right, so uh, kind of different kinds of eBPF things that you can instrument and do with it. There is this thing called trace points, which means you can trace point any syscall uh, within the Linux kernel. Uh, there's also a U probes, which uh, are user space probes, which means if you kind of know a function definition, you can watch that, which is pretty powerful. Uh, there's also K probes, which are allowing you to watch and instrument kernel functions. Um, and then there are is XTP packet filtering, which is kind of one of the original uses uh, for eBPF and even BPPF, BPF before that, um, which was uh, before it even gets into the kernel, being able to filter things um, really fast. And then there's uh, LSM modules. So you can instrument any uh, Linux security module hook um, and see what's going on there. And then what is Rust? Uh, that is a programming language. Let you write that source code that we were talking about. Uh, and it has a focus on performance, reliability, and productivity. Um, I used to write a lot of C++ and uh, now have kind of converted over to Rust and uh, very much enjoy it. So um, very excited that, uh, you know, in Linux 6.1, it is now part uh, of the build chain for the kernel. And so, um, but that is not what this talk is about. This talk is about writing Rust for the eBPF part of things and not the actual kernel itself. So um, that is where we're kind of writing our Rust code to. So then what is a performance regression? All right, and our last part here of what we're trying to prevent. Uh, it's the idea here is that performance bugs are bugs. Uh, a lot of times they get overlooked, right? Like folks might have lots of unit tests, but absolutely no benchmarks. Um, and it just kind of depends on the application you're building on whether that's important to you or not. Um, eBPF can up to add up to 100 milliseconds of latency if you really try. And so it is important there that like, you know, uh, on every single syscall, if you're adding that, that's, that's quite a huge overhead. So uh, I would argue that it's it's pretty important here. And then um, production is also the most costly place to find bugs. So preferably, we would shift that left as far as possible and find our performance regressions as early as possible. And generally, performance regressions, like when do they get detected, right? They can happen in development, and you can catch them there if you are happen to be looking for them and you're like doing performance tuning and things like that. But a lot of the time, it doesn't happen. And so, it's possible to catch them in CI and automate it just like we do unit tests. And the whole original idea of continuous integration um, is that those tests get run automatically so you don't even have to think about it. But most folks don't have anything set up there. And so that means it ends up getting all the way production when things are on fire and users are upset. That's when you tend to, tend to find those, those issues. So uh, kind of an overview of where we're going to go from here. Uh, we're going to look at a basic eBPF program written in Rust. We're then going to evolve that eBPF program. And then we're going to benchmark that eBPF program. And finally, look at continuous benchmarking for that eBPF program. So 
just an overview here of the possible eBPF tooling that we could use. Um, there's essentially uh, tools to write it just in C. And then there's BCC, which allows you to use both C, Python, and Lua. Um, and that just interacts with that um, lib eBPF that's written in C over there. Uh, or you could use Go, which is kind of a full stack Go solution. And uh, that, you know, is possible, but we are gonna be going with Rust here, uh, as maybe by the talk you can you can maybe have imagined. So looking at the Rust tooling, just kind of the ecosystem here, uh, the there's a wrapper uh, around the uh, lib eBPF or lib BPF, which is written in Rust, um, which means you can write your user space code in Rust, but you still have to write your eBPF code that gets compiled down into that bytecode in C and the syscalls there are also in C. Um, and then there was another library that came along called RedBPF that allows you to actually write your eBPF code in Rust, which is super cool. Uh, but it was still using libbpf as that interface there with the with the syscalls. And then Aya, uh, a really great library, uh, came out and that allows you kind of to do full stack Rust here. So we are we, we're swallowing the pill here and, and going going full stack Rust. So then uh, now on to our first part that we are going to talk about, which is a basic eBPF program written in Rust. So this is going to be an XDP program, just to keep it nice and simple. And all that this is going to do is log the IPv4, IPv4 source address of a packet that it receives. So uh, in order to create this, again, we've got our user space and kernel space side of things. This logo, this little robot here is going to indicate user space. And this B here is going to indicate kernel space. And you'll see it up on the top right hand corner there uh, to help us kind of know where we are at any time. So we're going to start off in the kernel space here in eBPF land. And so we've got this Rust function called funxtp, which takes in a context that is a uh, instrumenting an XTP call and it returns a unsized 32-bit integer as its result. And so using AIA, we say this is an XDP, uh, this is a macro that says we're going to be, you know, using an XDP um, instrumentation here. And then based off of the result from a helper function we're going to look at in a second, we either return the value we get, or if there's an error, then we just tell XDP to abort that packet. And taking a look at that helper function, uh, we get the ethernet header and then see if it's an IPv4 source address. Otherwise we just move along because we only care about IPv4. And then we then read that header and then get the source address from the header. And then we, we log it and then we pass. Um, and that's it. Um, pretty simple. We're going to take a qu quick look here at the, um, that pointer at helper function when we're getting the source address, the header. Um, and so this pointer at function, it's kind of an important thing to understand with eBPF here is that we're trying to uh, really make that, uh, that verifier happy here and make sure that we're not doing, reading any memory that we're not allowed to. And so we're essentially passing in this offset here and the context, we take the start and the end and then we take the length of the thing that we're trying to read. And then we make sure that our start plus the offset plus the length is, you know, not greater than the end. And if it is, we're going to error out because that tells the verifier that we are, you know, being good stewards here of uh, where we're going in memory. And then we return uh, the start plus the offset for getting the pointer address if it's good and inbounds. And then we also, again, to please the verifier, uh, Rust has the possibility of panicking. So we have to tell it like, we are not gonna panic here, that this is unreachable. So with that complete, we uh, are gonna move over to the user space side of things. And on the user space, we have a main function here and we are going to parse some command line arguments and init logging. We also have a path to our eBPF um, binary uh, that we have created. 
And then we're going to load that or bytecode and load that into the uh, the kernel. And then for that program that we init, we're going to get a handle to it. And yeah, load that, load that on in. Sorry, we, we loaded the logging there. Anyway, this is getting the, the program there and then initializing it. And then we're going to attach to it for the interface that gets passed in as one of the arguments to our function here. And then we'll wait until someone hits control C. And once they do, we'll exit. But in the meantime, we just kind of run our function. And so that is the very simple user space side of things. And so with that, we're done with our very, very simple eBPF uh, XDP application. So let's kind of, you know, uh, actually have it do something other than, you know, essentially hello world here and uh, evolve our eBPF program. So we're going to introduce the concept of maps. And so maps allow you to communicate between user space and eBPF land and uh, set data in between them. Uh, so we're going to add a fizz feature here, which is we're going to push fizz into a queue if the IPv source address is divisible by three and uh, otherwise return XTP paths. And so let's go ahead and do that. And again, we're going to start out, or we'll just take a look here, I guess, on our mental model of uh, where the kind of map, map fits into things. So from eBPF, we're going to pass over using that map into user space. So that's essentially what we're doing. Cool. So we'll start out taking a, taking a look at the map here. The code for that, that kind of map logic that's shared between both user space and the kernel is pretty simple. It's just the message that we'll be passing. It needs to be representable as C. Uh, we need to be able to clone and copy it. And uh, this is a AS sort of thing, which is on the user space side, right? We need to be able to like know that this is something that we can uh, kind of deserialize from the kernel. And that that's what that there is with the pod. And then also on the user space side, just for being able to see things nice and pretty, we can implement debug, but in the kernel, in eBPF land, we can't do that because there's no real concept of standard out and printing there. So that is the map side of things. And now we're gonna go and look at the kernel. And so with those kernel changes, uh, the first thing we do is declare a map, which is, saying that we have this queue and we're gonna you know, have up to uh, 1,024 uh, messages on that queue and those will be source address messages. And we're gonna update that try find XDP helper function that we looked at just a minute ago. And instead of just logging, what we're gonna do is check to see if the source address is divisible by three. And then if so, we go ahead and push it onto that queue, and then we pass. So that's uh, that's basically it. And then on the user space side, we also need to make some changes in that main function. We're going to create a spawn agent helper function, and then kind of just wait the same as before. And so if we look at that spawn agent helper function, uh, we have to create the user space side of this map, um, which is again, that queue and um, and then once we have that, we can just loop over reading off of it as long as there's items in the queue. And then we print those messages uh, from the user space site. So with that in place, that's kind of it for our V1 of really uh, our fizz feature here. And then let's look at adding a simple update to that, right? So this is our fizz buzz feature, right? I'm gonna you guys kind of know where this is going here. You push fish into the queue if the IPv source address is divisible by three, buzz if divisible by five, or fizz buzz if both. Otherwise, just return XTP pass. So then um, we're going to go and take a look now at the map and see what needs to get updated there. It's not that much. It's just these additional message types. So we had fizz before, now we're adding buzz and fizz buzz. And then on the kernel side of things, uh, again, we have to update our logic, but it's just implementing fizzbuzz here based off of that is what message we send. And if so, it gets sent across just like before. And then other, you know, at the end, we just return XTP pass. And there's really no changes to make on the user space side of things. So we're done.
So that is our, our next iteration of the code. And now, you know, let's, uh, you know, kind of make it even better, right? Let's make another seemingly simple update, which is FizzBuzz Fibonacci, okay? Um, so push Fizz, you know, divisible by three, Buzz is divisible by five, FizzBuzz of both, except if the remainder, if divided by 256 of the IPv source address is part of this Fibonacci sequence, then return Fibonacci. Otherwise return XP pass. So we're gonna go in there into our map, right? And we have to add an additional message type, which is Fibonacci. And then from there, we gotta go over to the kernel and update our logic again. So change the logic there. And now we're gonna be calling this is Fibonacci helper function before you know checking to see what message we need to send. And that is Fibonacci function just checks to see if the number is part of the Fibonacci sequence. Nice and easy. And then the user space side also stays the same. So we're good to go. Nice and easy. And everything's totally fine until three weeks later uh, when our customers are very upset and things are on fire. And we spend the whole day chasing our tails, trying to figure out what happened. And uh, that's when we finally get back to this you know, chunk of code here and we're taking a look at it. And then we decide to you know, investigate that is Fibonacci function. And we think, oh man, we are recalculating the is fi the Fibonacci sequence every single time. You know, this this could be drastically improved. So we're gonna, you know, make a fourth version of our app here, a memoized version, in which we, you know, simply check whether it's against the because there's not really that many fib numbers in the Fibonacci sequence below 256, right? So we can just we can just check this. Um Nice and simple. Now, I don't know if you guys notice anything here, um, but I asked ChatGPT to give me all the Fibonacci numbers below 256, and this is what it gave me. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you notice, we uh, are indeed missing one. So robot overlords aren't, aren't quite taken over just yet. Cool, so with that in place, we are now able to go play firefighter, put out the fire in production and solve everything. But like, why, why did it have to get this far, right? Why did it have to get all the way to production before we could fix things? Why can't we ship this left, right? So we're going to take a look at trying to catch these performance regressions in development and uh, what we can do there. So now let's look at benchmarking an eBPF program in Rust. Because you can't improve what you don't measure. So before we dig in too much, we kind of have to understand micro versus macro benchmarking. Uh, micro, I think of as like unit tests. So this would be checking our is Fibonacci function directly. Uh, and macro would be doing something kind of more at the integration level, equivalent to integration tests. And this would be that spawn agent function that uh, we had over on the user space side of things. So first we're gonna take a look at the micro benchmarks. So our kind of options for doing Rust micro benchmarking there's libtest bench, which is built into the Rust standard library, but it's nightly only, and it's currently in the process of some pretty drastic revamping. And uh, you have to use an unrelated crate, also called Venture, uh, if you want to use it on stable Rust. And it's not actively, you know, being developed for uh, like keeping with what it's doing right now. And as I said, it's gonna be, there's a lot of churn. There's a lot of things that are about to happen there. So um, keep a lookout, but probably not the, the best choice. Uh, then there's Criterion, which is a available, available on both stable and nightly. Um, and it has kind of become a de facto standard in the community here. And it is much more feature rich and allows for a lot uh, better analysis and comparison of your benchmarks. And then the uh, final option we're kind of look at here is IAI, uh, which also available on both uh, stable and nightly, but it's considered experimental. Um, and it's set from the same creator as Criterion. And it does things a little bit differently. It does single shot benchmarking using cache grind. So it counts uh, instruction counts, L1 accesses, L2 accesses, RAM, and estimated cycles. So uh, this can be really great for kind of single shot benchmarking. Um, as opposed to using wall clock time. Uh, just to kind of keep things simple here, we're gonna use Criterion 
Um, and then, so yeah, so let's take a look at uh, using Criterion then for micro benchmarks. We're going to go over to this map section. And what we're going to be doing is actually refactoring code from the kernel side into this map section since we're able to kind of access it uh, a little bit easier. Um, and so in our dev dependencies, we're going to add criterion. And then we're going to add our benchmark called source address. And we're going to say harness is false since we're using criterion and not the default built in benchmark runner. And so we're going to uh, implement for that source address kind of um, uh, message type that we created. We're going to implement a function for it where we just pass in the source address. And here is where we calculate uh, what message should be sent back based off of the source address. And so this is the same exact code as our last version of the application. And if we take a look at kind of the uh, this benchmark here, we take in a criterion object, create our, us, our source address benchmark, and we're going to run it for every number from 0 to 256, try and create a new one. And then this is kind of set up here for criterion is um, creating a benchmark group, and then our main function to run those benchmarks. And all we then have to do is run cargo bench, and our benchmarks will run. And so we will be able to benchmark the source address there. So that's micro benchmarking. And now all done. Nice and easy. Um, now macro benchmarking down here, this is gonna get a little bit more complicated um, because we're having to test end to end with the eBPF side of things, which means we you know can't just move things over from the kernel side. We, we really need to uh, instrument that. And so there's a couple of different ways uh, to instrument kind of looking at eBPF. There's kernel BPF stats enabled. Uh, which collects both the runtime nanoseconds and the total run count, all eBPF programs. So it gives you the total amount of time it took and the number uh, of times it ran. Uh, it was added in kernel version 5.1. It's off by default. Oh. And it's off by default. Okay. Uh, then the uh, next one is uh, BPF tool uh, program profile. That uh, it's sort of like IAI, but on the um, the kernel side of things. So it collects perf counts. So there's instructions, uh, loads, and misses, and cycles, and things like that. And so if we were to be using IAI, this might actually be a good complement on the uh, integration side of things. Uh, it was added in 5.7, uh, but it does require BPF tool to be built with client greater than version 10. And then uh, another one in BPF tool is program run, which is pretty pretty neat. It uh, lets you run a specific eBPF program and then like provide its input and context there. And it will return its output in the, the data context as well. It was added in 4.12, but only for specific eBPF program types, which I, I've listed here. Um, and even though XDP is on that list, like most of the ones folks are going to use uh, aren't here. And so instead, we're going to go with the BPF stats enabled uh, for our example. All righty. So in order to make this work, we're going to have to make uh, quite a few changes here on the user space side. Uh, in our main function, we're still going to parse arguments. But now we're going to add this shutdown Boolean. And we will pass that into this helper eBPF run function. And then we just wait as before. And then if we get an exit, then we tell the shutdown that we are indeed shutting down. And then we, we exit. And so let's take a look at that eBPF run function there. Uh, it is going to return this process structure, which is the process ID, the program FD, and a uh, handle to a running process. And so this will become important for being able to um, both run this as an application, but also cleanly start it up and shut it down when we are benchmarking. So we get the process ID of what is running here. And then we uh, get the program and load it just as we did before. And then we're going to spawn it as an async sort of um, 
process. So it's kind of running, you think on another thread or green thread sort of thing and uh, using the spawn agent helper function. And then we return the process information. So taking a look at that spawn agent helper function, it takes in the BPF that we're running in that shutdown pool. And so we create the map like we did with our, our previous helper function and then loop over and get the source addresses and print them out like we did before. But the only real difference here is that we're checking every so often that uh, we should indeed exit. And that's it. And then on to the custom harness. So this is uh, basically kind of recreating what Criterion did for us and the micro benchmarking. And so we just have a benchmark and a, a name and a function. And we use this crate called inventory to help kind of collect those up. And we don't have a macro like on Criterion to make our main function. So we're going to do that ourselves. We have results, our VEC of results. And then so for each of those benchmarks that we register with inventory, we're going to go through, parse the benchmark name, and then we're going to run that benchmark function. And then we're going to take the output and we're going to assume that it's in uh, the JSON format that uh, we would like. And then we'll kind of push it onto our results here. And then we're going to uh, parse those results as JSON and then put it into a string, save it to a file, and uh, we're good to go. So then that's us adding a specific fun XTP benchmark to uh, those that we're going to use. And so taking a look at that there, we are essentially just going to return a 64-bit floating point as the results of however long you know uh, it takes for this benchmark. And so we are going to need to spawn a new runtime, create a new shutdown, and then with that, create a copy of it and spawn our process very similar to what we did on the uh, like user space kind of main program side of things, right? Using that run helper function. And then we're going to do some work, like go into a cool website like Bencher.dev. And then uh, we're going to get the stats. And then we'll finally shut down and return those stats. And so taking a look at the get PPF stats, we are going to go into the uh, proc FD info file for our specific process and the file descriptor that we're given for the eBPF program. And we're going to read that file and then just basically loop through until we find those runtime nanoseconds and the run count that we wanted. And then if they're both there, we basically just calculate the average runtime and otherwise we return zero. So either we get the time and return it, turn the average or, or we don't. So uh, there we go. So now we actually can run this. And like I said, uh, BPF stats enabled is disabled by default. So we have to set that to one um, if we want to be able to do this. And then once that is enabled, we can uh, build our eBPF binary that, or um, it's not quite a binary, but um, code that we need to be able to hand the kernel. And then we CD into our user space side of the code and because this has to run eBPF. We need to run it with elevated privileges, which is why we're pseudoing here before we basically run what's equivalent to cargo bench. Um, and then the output of that is going to be this uh, the results here from our fun XTP function in JSON format. Um, and we basically have that value there for the latency. All right, so that is the user space side of things. And that's it. Those are all the changes that we need for uh, the micro benchmarking. So a lot more work here on the user space side for creating that, that custom harness here. Uh, that was maybe kind of a lot. That is a how to build a, a Rust custom bench har benchmark harness hidden here inside the talk as well. So uh, that is the uh, macro benchmarks kind of all taken care of. And so now that we've uh, benchmarked uh, our eBPF program, we're going to kind of look at continuous benchmarking, which is um, sort of comes to this question, like, uh, does your software performance matter, right? Like, and if so, which I think in most cases with eBPF, uh, and where are use cases is the answer that's yes. And like, 
but looking at more generally, like software where performance matters, there's kind of a scale, right? Um, I like to think about it. You've got kind of performance criticality here, uh, ascending, going down. And there's enterprise applications where, you know, uh, the buyer is not generally the user. So the performance of it doesn't really have to be all that great. Um, then you got kind of more business level applications where, um, you know, it, it's sort of nice to have and consumer applications where, you know, folks make churn if it, it kind of doesn't work, but it can be, you know, like a react web page, it's fine. Um, and then kind of farther down here, kind of a bit of a gap away, uh, you kind of have database software and kind of library software and system software, um, which is definitely where we are with the, the kernel and eBPF kind of sits somewhere in between here, between the library and system software. And so that's definitely us. And then how to track the software performance, right? Because not all software has access to production. Um, and again, we got another axis here. And if you think about this as like access to production, at the very far end down here, you have Dynatrace, Sentry, New Relic, all these like Datadog, these APM tools um, that do give, if you have access to production, let you instrument everything, see all that you want, observability and things like that. Um, but for the folks who either have very limited or no access to production, there's not really all that many good tools uh, for doing this. Um, and that's kind of where Venture fits in. Um, so the idea here is that instead of waiting for things to get all the way to production, which is too late, you try and shift it as far left, but then running things in development the problem is that that's local only and manual. And for the same reasons that we started running integration tests and in CI, we in like unit tests, we also want to run our benchmarks there. And so that's the idea behind continuous benchmark. So Venture is a tool, open source tool that I built uh, in order to be able to do this. Uh, it's open source. It's both self-hostable and there's a SaaS version at Venture.dev. It has multi-tenancy, multi-language support um, through adapters. So you can use things other than Rust with it. Um, and then it has statistical thresholds and alerts. So if that threshold gets exceeded, you can have it fail your build and even comment on your pull request. And then it also integrates with GitHub Actions to make that really easy. So kind of the idea is that to track your benchmarks as we went through those versions of our application, right? The first couple were kind of fine, maybe add a little bit more latency. And then that final version is really what, you know, blew the top off and should have generated an alert for us. Um, and that's about detecting those performance regressions. And so like this is actual dog fooding here with Venture um, being able to kind of go in and detect uh, performance anomalies here. And, um, and so, yeah, this is an example of the statistical threshold uh, set there between uh, the main branch and a merge request branch. And the way this works with detecting those anomalies is again, using kind of statistical thresholds. So um, as you're kind of like get those first couple data points, they're gonna be here near the mean essentially. And then that last point is gonna be out here farther down the distribution. And essentially where that green uh, section ends is gonna kind of be the cutoff of what is acceptable in the distribution function. And then you generate alert when you exceed it. So uh, with continuous benchmarking with Criterion, trying to uh, do this with Venture, it's pretty simple. You would just do Venture run and you get the, use the adapter for us Criterion. Uh, and then you run Cargo Bench. And then you can pass in the error flag if you want, which is uh, the thing that will make it fail if a threshold is exceeded and an alert is generated. And then on the macro benchmarking, the you can do venture run again. And then this adapter is gonna be JSON because we created that JSON output. And you're gonna read in the file and then run that command. And again, you can have it fail in CI. Uh, if there's a problem. So uh, that is what kind of Venture allows you to do to catch performance regressions in CI. 
Uh, and in order to add it to GitHub Actions nice and easily, there's actually a built-in GitHub Action to download it here. And um, you know, if that branch exists, it'll it'll run. There's a bunch of documentation on the Venture.dev website about how to set this up and how to get things integrated uh, with GitHub and um, be able to comment on your pull requests. And I can go into that more if you all are interested. Um, so in summary, continuous benchmarking, uh, like detection leads to the prevention here. Uh, production is too late, development is local only, and continuous benchmarking can save us a lot of pain. And also don't reinvent the wheel again. Uh, I have an entire prior art section of folks who have had to reinvent the wheel here because there hasn't been a like easy to use, readily available tool to do this before. And so everyone just kind of has rolled their own. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm hoping to uh, save you all a lot of work <laughs> and uh, make that easy going forward. Uh, Venture also has super high dimensionality, which is kind of one of the things uh, that allows it uh, I feel to like offer to you be able to use it for just about any project that cares about this because it compares things both based off branch. So such as your main branch, the test bed. So if you're running on um, like GitHub Actions, that'd be like Ubuntu latest, uh, specific benchmark in our case, like fun XDP. Uh, and then also the specific metric kind, so like latency. So here is an example of running four different benchmarks and comparing them all. They're running on the same branch test bed, but they're different benchmarks in the same metric kind. And then if we wanted to kind of compare instead to something like uh, the develop branch versus the main branch, then we can also slice and dice that way. Again, so this is the same benchmark, but now we're comparing the differences in um, in the branch that we're running this on. So this is helpful both for kind of looking at things like this with comparisons, but also when you're creating those thresholds, a lot of the other tools uh, that people tend to make are a little simpler and that they can't handle this difference. And so you say can't like, separate out, hey, we're running on a Windows box or a Linux box um, or like a Mac here for the test bed. Or even if it's both on Linux, you know, this one's ARM and this one's x86 and things like that. And so for a lot of folks, they do want to be able to do those comparisons. And so this high dimensionality is super important uh, within Venture. You also get a public perf page. So this is a, for public projects, you're able to kind of be able to direct people. And when it comes up, comments on the PR, this is an easy way it pulls up um, for you to be able to see exactly what's going on and track things over time and uh, kind of do those slice and dice comparisons based off the dimensions that I was talking about. Um, this is publicly available. You don't have to sign in kind of thing. Uh, there's also the ability to embed your perf plot. So if you want to kind of stick it in a, a bigger site or somewhere in your documentation or things like that, um, you can also, if you just hit the, the share button, it's it's there to uh, be able to embed it. And there's also static images versions of these. So if you want to be able to embed them to your readme, which uh, I think is pretty nifty because uh, you can't have dynamic content in GitHub readmes, but this all the dynamic stuff is done on the back end. So it's a static image uh, with a very low refresh rate, basically zero. Uh, from GitHub's point of view. So every time they pull it, we regenerate this image for you of exactly what your uh, your plots look like. So um, so that's kind of continuous benchmarking there with Venture. Uh, in summary, kind of our overview here, we went over creating a basic eBPF program in Rust. And then we evolved that eBPF program, right? Add Fizz, FizzBuzz, and then FizzBuzz Fibonacci. And then we finally fixed our performance regression there uh, with FizzBuzz Fibonacci. Then we went into how to benchmark our programs, both on the micro and macro benchmarking to try and prevent, figure out how we could prevent those performance regressions in the future. And then finally, continuous benchmarking. And when it's applicable, 
when we care about performance? And um, if so, what do we do about it uh, as opposed to just kind of rolling our own solution there? So um, that's been run fast, catch performance in eBPF with Rust. Um, again, that's the, the repo link. And if you don't feel like typing that much, you can just go to bench.dev slash repo and that will just forward you there. And uh, yeah, if you guys like the project, uh, please uh, do give it a star. It, it actually helps <laughs> um, people use it to, you know, kind of think about projects. So, yeah. So, Everett, you said um, uh, you can use this to benchmark any project. Um, what is uh, a project, largest project you, uh, you or others used to benchmark? Yeah, um, I think the largest public one would probably be Hydra, which is a database, um, is using it. Um, there's there's a few others who have picked it up and they're using it there. Um, and so I guess the, the key question is like, are you, is the concern in size there, the like number of benchmarks that are being tracked or? I, I was just uh, looking to see the kind of um, projects or uh, software that could benefit from venture and how it's be, it wanting to learn more about how it's being currently used. Uh, yeah. Who is using it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I am using it. Uh, so yeah, there's quite Hydra a few users who have signed up and and used it. Um, the public projects are probably the best place to kind of go and look for that. Um, but yeah, I know for sure, like the Hydra folks, um, might be kind of a good example to talk about and using that to track their database performance. Okay. Um, yeah. So it, it tends to be kind of like library code and those sorts of things where, uh, there's no production environment for them to kind of instrument into. Right. So if, if, if you were to, if, um, somebody were to look into how they could use it, to benchmark kernel per se, um, mm -hmm. so any of the uh, that would be the libraries, is that correct or? Yeah. So the key the key part is like venture is benchmark harness agnostic. Mm -hmm. So there's these adapters that are there to uh, make it easy for folks who kind of use pretty standard um, benchmarking mm -hmm. uh, harnesses to be able to. They don't even have to actually. In the docs here, I said that we're specifying the harness. You don't even have to specify it. Venture can just know it. Uh, it kind of grocks which harness you're using without you telling it. And um, and so there's that. But then if you say are doing kernel development and you have a special benchmark runner or harness that as long as you can output that JSON that Venture understands, um, you're able to use it. So it's kind of uh, completely agnostic to exactly how the benchmarks are run. So yeah, so like the way that the project works and things like that, uh, the way I designed it specifically is that this could be used um, across basically any project. Pick a benchmark, that kernel benchmark, and then hook mm -hmm. it up with Bencher and um, pro uh, make sure that it uh, Bencher can understand the output yeah. JSON. Yeah, yeah it's a... Uh... It's like a it's a pretty simple um format. Like if I actually let's go to the docs. So this is basically the format here. Like as long as it's the benchmark name, this is the metric kind, so latency, and then these values, the lower and upper up upper value. That's if it outputs something in that format, Venture can can take it and um, do all of its magic. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, so that's uh, to tie this kind of back to the talk here. That custom, mm -hmm. so uh, like Venture obviously wouldn't have a adapter for a custom benchmark harness mm -hmm. that we did for our macro benchmarks. And so that's why when we had this here, we outputted, put this format here, which is the uh, BMF, the venture metric format. Mm -hmm. So 
Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. As uh, uh, so we um, th we have some benchmarks we run, you know, kernel uh, performance benchmarks. Perf tool runs um, part of the kernel. Yeah. So that outputs the uh, so if we wanted to use um, um, Venture mm -hmm. to do we automate some of that um, benchmarking and then then we have to hook it up with the output to be JSON. So yep. perf bench mm -hmm. is what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about this. There is a okay. perf bench that uh, in the kernel that we use. Okay. So. Oh. Yeah, it, it should be, uh, you know, like fairly simple to to get it to play nice together. Um, so. And then, then yeah, so it generates. Um, if it generates that, then uh, that could be made. The benchmarks could be run on the kernel. We do run them. Um, you know, people do run the perf benchmarks on. Uh, new, as kernel new new releases are coming out, but uh, it would be... yeah, it tends to be folks like right now. It's either it's manual, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it's kind of like a homegrown solution, you know, that kind of like uh, like Rust Perf is an example mm -hmm. of one where they've they've kind of uh, I've taken a lot of inspiration from them. But like, you know, it's just for the Rust project. <laughs> you get luck using it for anything else kind of thing. Um, so do you guys have like Dedic, is it tend to just be someone like running it on a box they have at their house to compare it? Or do you guys have like a, a hardware setup where? Well, well, there is the Cardinal CI that we have. Um, mm -hmm. They run primarily tests. And I don't know that, I don't know if they run per performance benchmarks. I tend to run them manually. At the okay. moment, at, uh, you know, when I am looking at a performance problem or something mm -hmm. looks off, or I want to get a generally um, uh, see uh, what's happening. And for, for uh, developers, kernel developers, they run them, of course. They are continuously using them and running them. But, uh, and then various uh, uh, users run them as well. There is a user base that runs them, but most of all of it is manual. Okay. It would be manual. Okay. Who would who would be the like right right folks? I'll be at Plumbers next yeah. week. Um, would there be any folks that would uh, be good to chat with about that? Oh yeah. So there is. Uh, uh, if you are going to be at the Plumbers, I'm going to be there as well. Um, okay. So the there is the performance talks that are happening. Um, yeah. Perf, uh, either I don't think there is a micro conference, but there is a perf. Um, uh, perf uh, talk uh, either at the kernel summit or referee track check those out okay. i don't remember i do remember seeing um, a uh, perf talk um, in the list i i'm on the program committee as i'm trying to remember if i have seen any i think i have seen a one or two perf talks okay. um, that would be on the performance like i mentioned the perf bench tool that we have uh, yeah perf Perf, perf tool does a lot more than benchmarking. It does a lot of other things, but benchmarking is one of its things. You can just yeah. pick up the, um, if you have a kernel repo and you are running the latest kernel, you can, you can just go, um, just say perf bench CPU, for example. It'll run benchmarks on the CPU or perf yeah. bench mem or perf bench all. It'll by default run CPU memory and uh, uh, I think SCAD. It'll run it on the scheduler. So, okay. cool. that so, sounds really good. Okay. So yeah, look look those up on uh, LPC. Um, I think schedule is out. You can take a look and see if. Uh, um, yeah, the, the, I think the schedule is there. I, yeah. I started taking notes on on what I might go to. So, okay. um, cool. That sounds good. And uh, any questions from anybody? This has been a very silent group today any questions on um uh, uh, the importance of um getting uh, let not letting these escape to the product and any questions on how expensive could it be if it were to escape to the um to 
to release after release or finding benefits of finding it now. Yeah, it's like 10x the cost or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty... 10x the cost. Yeah, depending on depending on where the problem is, really. In yeah. some cases, the problem could be, uh, depending on what you're testing, right? If, you, if there is yeah. a, uh, a testing of you have a product that has the vertical of hardware, software, after firmware and kernel and all of those. And the problem could be somewhere in the somewhere um, in in the place you can't really um, easily fix once it's deployed. Yeah. Um, so so yep. yeah, 10x. Sweet. Um, well, uh, do folks kind of want to want to take a look at Venture here? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. You, we have okay. time. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, if we go back here, uh, this is, uh, me dog fooding venture with venture. So, um, this is the, uh, okay, there we go. Okay. This is me dog fooding venture with venture here. And, uh, so this is the latest report, which is from when I push things up on Halloween to release. Here and these are just kind of those adapters that I was talking about. We track those, and so these alerts here are me playing with how tight can I get the threshold on uh, GitHub Actions just using the default runners. So there's kind of a couple of uh, thoughts here on you know how to run your benchmarks because you've you can you know get a nice pristine isolated bare metal box that you run your benchmarks on and you know only use that single runner uh for all of your benchmarks and like control you know like climate control the room and everything and like you know to get it as much noise reduction as possible and um you know and somewhere from there to kind of what i'm doing here which is just running uh with the default runners on github actions and so if we kind of look at this boundary you can see me sort of playing with it around over time and still trying to figure out where, you know, even though this code hasn't changed it, you see kind of the variance here in the runs, what, uh, what's the kind of the best way to, to handle that statistically. And so like, what, what's the value and how much, what's the noise threshold there. And so, um, so yeah, that that's kind of a thing. Uh, I'm also looking at with venture long-term to make it easier to do those dedicated runners that might be a little less noisy than CI. So if anyone is interested in that, please reach out. Um, I've been working with some of the kind of uh, Pyre profile Rust projects to that are also looking at this um, to kind of see what they want to do there. And so um, there's that. And so, yeah, if we kind of look at, just take a look at one of these alerts, even though this is a false positive right now because of the, you know, playing here with the constraints. But if it wasn't, if we wanted to kind of look at it, we can come in here and it will tell us kind of where it occurred and the kind of upper boundary uh, that was calculated there and what our actual value was. And so that we exceeded it. And we can also dismiss that alert. So then if we go back to the perf plot, um, the alert, I guess we'll, we'll refresh here, make it easier. That alert goes away. Um, so you can dismiss alerts um, based off of how you wanna handle them. And as you can see, I have a bunch of alerts cause I've been playing around with it here uh, as we kind of uh, set things up. The metric kinds are essentially the units so these are reports, which is uh, the running of all those benchmarks um, together, which is what we were just looking at in the plot. Uh, the metric kinds, by default, each project starts with latency and throughput, um, but you can add additional ones. So if you're using something like that IAI adapter, uh, there's actually a, um, a built-in um, adapter for that in Venture, and it'll create the four metric kinds, the kind of uh, you know, instruction counts and things like that um, here for you. Or like with the kernel, if you're using perfbench, then 
this will be, uh, you can add whatever your kind of standard units are that you, you want to care to calculate there if it's something different than these. Um, and then with the branches, as you can see, uh, these are for merge requests. I did not create these. These are uh, the way I configured things in CI. These are created um, from my uh, the branch that they're branched off of. So this happens to be devel. And so the, the branch here basically does a shallow copy of that branch. And then any uh, new metrics that are added on top of it are just for that PR branch. And so um, that allows you to try and catch those performance regressions in CI um, by in like on PRs before they actually merge into your mage branch, ma main branch. Um, when those branches get cloned, it also clones the threshold, uh, which we'll take a look at in a second. Um, there's test buds, uh, which by default, you just start with localhost. Uh, this is my Ubuntu latest test bed, which is used for um, running things on GitHub Actions. And then the benchmarks, uh, these are the benchmarks that uh, I have set up so far with Bencher, which is just for those kind of, there's more adapters, but this is just kind of showing uh, there's a magic adapter, which allows you to not, it's the default. And so if you don't specify an adapter, uh, the parsing is smart enough to figure out which adapter should be used and use that. But it means it's a little bit slower. And then these are the thresholds uh, that I was talking about. So uh, essentially, if something is a merge request running against Devel or main, it will essentially clone the uh, threshold that is there and then use that in its processing. So um, this is the example of that cloning a student's t-test with a 0.95% uh, cutoff there, which means like below in that cumulative distribution function with a maximum sample size of 30. So uh, that's the thresholds. Uh, we took a look at the alerts um, here. And so these are the alerts for the different benchmarks um, that we hit that we kind of looked at here a minute ago. So yeah, that is the uh, venture and like being able to use statistical thresholds. Uh, you can also visualize visualize the lower and upper boundaries here. It's probably easier to see if we're only looking at a single plot. So if you do have those lower and upper boundaries um, and much variance, you can also visualize those. There's ability to, right now this is based off of date. So this is days in October here, but you can also change the x-axis to be based off of um, the version number. And so this just kind of increments with each version you push up. Um, so if you just kind of want a, a more normalized view of things as they kind of go through here, uh, that is available there. So yeah. Um, also for folks who are non-native English speakers, uh, I have translated the docs using GPT-4 into eight different languages. So um, yeah, hopefully one of those might might be uh, more useful for me. So, um, so I'm just looking at uh, the ben, um, Venture Dev. Um, mm -hmm. You have a self-hosted and mm -hmm. Venture Cloud. So mm -hmm. what does um, Venture Cloud entail? if a project wants to use Venture and Venture Cloud? Yeah, great question. So um, the Venture Cloud is essentially the same thing you're going to, it's the Venture self-hosted. Like I'm just running it for you on Venture.dev. Uh, and so the, uh, the just thing is you don't have to worry about running it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the key pieces. Um, I, I am trying to, you know, uh, pay, pay and maintain it by, uh, charging for private projects, but if you're a public project, then it's completely free to use. So, so that is the cloud one that you're talking about. Um, that's both, it's, that's both, both instances. Okay. So like, but I mean, if you put it behind your VPN and no one can access it, you know, like 
as long as you're okay with folks who have access within your VPN being able to come to this projects page and uh, take a look at things, then you know that's uh, you're fine. I see. Okay. So that, that's all good. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Everett today? What would you would you if there are um, developers that want to get involved in your project, either by improving venture and such, um, what would they do? Yeah, great question. Um, so I have a couple of good first issues uh, tagged here for different adapters. If any of those are kind of pertinent to folks, probably within this community, the like hyperfine adapter might be a good one, which is a like a CLI tool for like benchmarking binaries and things like that, um, which uh, might be a, a good one to start with. And it should hopefully be very easy to uh, get started contributing. I have a, um, a dev, you can use both a local dev container or a GitHub code space to um, start developing in. So if you don't want to have to kind of download and install everything, you basically just click those. And I have scripts set up that will uh, auto set up everything you need inside of there. So that uh, dev container will just uh, create a, that works on um, any operating system? Any yep. DG? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the uh, the dev container is, uh, if, if you want to do the EPF, EBPF stuff, you need to be on Linux. <laughs> Um, so, of course, yeah. but but if you just general venture uh things then yes uh this this dev container um should spin up and it also when it spins up it also spins up the development uh backend server and ui and so you're kind of like ready to go out of the box with um, with it yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is an example of the kind of PR comment that you'll get uh, oh, okay. with Venture while we're here. Um, yeah, so like if you have an alert, this will pop up and you can view the plot and view the alert and things like that. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Awesome. Sweet. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, I okay. will stop sharing. Yeah. Candace? Will... Yep, I can wrap us up. Uh, thank you, Everett and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. And a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.